Good morning to you. <laughs> Good morning. I'm, I, I'm waiting for this one. Oh, I, this, <laughs> a little nervous, are you? There's no way you could, you could not prepare for this one because this is one I just came up with the other day. I, you know, usually I can listen before the break <laughs> and know what you're up to, but yeah. not today. No, this one, there's no way you know what I'm up to here. Okay, so let's say that you are an avowed nudist. <laughs> I don't mean Patrick Morrissey is an avowed nudist. I mean just Joe Public. You are an avowed nudist. I have, I have, I have two questions for you on this. It's, it's in your home. You only, you only believe in the nudist part of your nudist faith in your own home. Somebody knocks on the door. You open the door naked. Naked as a jaybird, as they say. And uh, the person at the door is not expecting you to be naked, but this is your home. So you open the door, you're now naked. Are you subject to any type of criminal complaint opening the door naked in your home? Now, the sub, per, you know, step one on this is the first scenario is an adult, and the second scenario is, let's say it's someone, Boy Scout selling mulch, Girl Scout Agreed. selling cookies, right. okay? So, but you are on your own private property. Does that end when you open the door? I'll tell you what, you know, given this fact pattern, it's probably best for me to reanalyze the criminal code. And the reason I say this, as the attorney general of the state, what if this fact pattern occurred? I would be the one who would have to make sure our team is analyzing it correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, I will say this to everyone listening. The deference is always that within your own home, you're your own master, right? right. And you can do almost whatever you want. And that makes a difference, uh, not quite anything. But uh, so I don't think people really care what you do with, generally speaking, within your home. Uh, what happens when something's in plain view? Uh, you know, it's an interesting question that I'm going to uh, I'm going to have to look at. I know from experience, not from my experience, it was in the neighborhood when I was Good growing save, up. Good save, John. Good <laughs> save. I, I'm not going to look at it. <laughs> yeah, I let you now, get away with that one. There was, there was a, a, when I was growing up, there was a kid in our neighborhood who was arrested. He would stand naked, a kid, teenager, would stand naked in his window as kids would go to the bus stop. And he was arrested for that as, I guess, exhibitionism or whatever. So, I, I, Right. Of course, that was that was when I was a kid, which was some time ago. So, <laughs> Rob, we can potentially solve this. That's why you have those half doors on your front door. So, <laughs> depending on whether you're male or female, you can just open the top or the bottom half, receive the package from the delivery man, and and then move on. <laughs> well, you know, actually, that sounds like a pretty good deal. <laughs> I think I'm going to take that off. But how does that help females? Well, like I said, maybe oh. I, uh, there's, 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 <laughs> you got dual exposure. I can't tell you the number of times I've watched Cops, the TV show Cops, yeah. and I'm wondering, you know, when the police are coming, why don't you put clothes on? Because everybody that's arrested, right, they're just in their underwear, or it, it's you, you'd think that that's a time. If you, I would think that if you're going to go to jail, you'd want to have clothes on. That's just common sense to me. I'm, I'm going to have to agree with you. I think in the heat of the moment, you're not thinking about going to jail. Right. Well, you got you got the privacy of your own home, but what if your kids are having a sleepover? Right? They invite their friends over. You're still in your home. You're not exposed to the public, but you've got now you've got people in your house. But it's my house. These are my rules. This is sounding like a very personal thing now. It's, it's not that you know. <laughs> No, it's just these are things I think of in my free time whenever I know Patrick's coming on the show. <laughs> so, uh, oh my goodness! <laughs> you know, it's funny because yeah. you hear about this not exact back pattern, but you think about, for instance, indecent exposure. Yeah, and usually you're referencing it in a public place, right? And so, for instance, this back pattern actually comes up sometimes uh, where you might have some. Uh, you know, some drunk folks outside of a football game or they're doing something and people get arrested that way. And so then they might be charged with indecent exposure. But usually the fact pattern says in a public place. So what exactly is a public place? <clears throat> so I don't know whether 
I mean, that's why you have to go back to the statute and look at the words to see how the various crimes are defined. Is there something that would be kind of a lewdness or uh, indecent exposure, once again, might be on the, uh, the public place. But what I will do, uh, because you've asked the question, um, we've got to go back and, and look at that uh, to see the definitions, because I actually literally wouldn't want to give you the answer uh, of some fact pattern that might come up, because it's, uh, it's an interesting question that I had not thought yeah. of before. So. You played stump the attorney general, and you did it. All right. Point for the <laughs> robster. Nice. <laughs> Sweet. Put that little notch in the belt there. Hey, I want to get on a serious subject. I want to talk to you about uh, the issue of fentanyl, the number one killer of people aged 18 to 45. On September the 13th, you had a press release saying we must do all we can yeah. to stop nitazines, xylazine from gaining a foothold in West Virginia. And, and that assumes that it hasn't already gained a foothold in West Virginia, Mr. Attorney General? Well, look, we have heard of instances of uh, these nitazines and what they can do, and I'm very worried about them. We've been hearing about them more and more, and these nitazines are, we think, 10 to 20 times more powerful than fentanyl, which is already way more powerful than heroin. And I'm hearing more and more about fentanyl and these other synthetic opioids, which can be even stronger and that's a deep concern to me, uh, because especially when I go and I talk to kids and you learn how much kids are vaping and how we hear of situations where the vaping devices, the uh, things that are included within the vaping machine, that fentanyl might be laced with it. Now imagine if it's fentanyl and nitazines or xylazines. And so the problem is these synthetics continue to grow a little bit more powerful. And that's really a death sentence for anyone who may take it, uh, because regardless of the potency of the tools that the first responders have, if you have one of these products and you get laced or you get a, uh, a little bit in it, wow, you're, you're going to be in a really tough spot. There was a bust made by, I guess it was Customs on uh, Fentanyl recently, where it was packaged under a different name, I guess something that wouldn't normally get searched. Uh, there was a, quite a bit of it that had been discovered, and it was from China. Do we have an official tie-in to make a connection between the Chinese government and this, or are we operating under the assumption that these are just bad actors in China that the government has no idea are operating and shipping things to this country? Look, so we've actually been looking at a lot of the issues uh, pertaining to the Chinese ingredients, uh, which come, you know, they, they come out of mainland China, they get shipped to the Mexican drug cartels, and then they're packaged together and eventually make their way into the U.S. I will tell you that I do believe the Chinese government is absolutely knowledgeable about what's going on. And the reason I say that is because through our study, we saw that the Chinese government and the U.S. government actually came up with a memorandum of understanding with the Homeland Security Department under President Trump to not ship all of this uh, poison directly to the U.S. So there was actually a policy change back in April of 19. Unfortunately, what seemed to happen is that uh, some of the raw ingredients and the material that used to be shipped directly into U.S. ports started to get go south to the Mexican drug cartel. So what that tells me is that there is knowledge, um, but, you know, like anything, you want to make sure that you have all the proof and, and you have to be in a position where you can go after that. But I do believe that the Chinese government and uh, many people in China are aware of the fact of what's going on and, in fact, uh, they know the danger, and there's obviously been significant amount of death as a result of the behavior, and that's utterly unacceptable. And uh, I, I have asked for the Biden administration, through their DEA and others, to get to the bottom of that. I've asked for Secretary of State Tony Blinken to raise it uh, when he was talking to China. Uh, I, I am beside myself that the Biden administration is not doing more uh, with respect to not only the broader border fight, but the broader drug fights 
And it, it bothers me as someone who has put an enormous amount of time into fighting the drug epidemic. I mean, how are we going to succeed in our efforts when the Biden administration is failing and when there's what looks very much to be concerted effort going on in China to ship this poison to the drug cartels where they know it's going to come to the U.S.? Patrick, I am neither an attorney, nor do I play one on TV or radio, nor did I stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. But Im immediately, as you brought up the terms of this not shipped directly, I wrote the word directly with uh, a little quotation marks around it on my notes here because, uh, okay, I won't do it directly. I'll do it indirectly. So is there not an opportunity to sign an agreement that says, look, don't ship this stuff at all? Well, look, I mean, the question's going to be whether the Chinese are going to live up to their uh, their word, whether it's direct or indirect. And I would, if I were in the Biden administration right now, I'd put unbelievable amounts of pressure on the Chinese to change this. And so this has got to actually be a major foreign policy initiative. And uh, the reason I mentioned, I mean, we wrote to Blinken. We've written to Mayorkas. We've written... Uh, to the attorney general, we've talked about this issue ad nauseum, and I've been drawing attention to it. And I'm really glad you asked me this question, because this is the area where the administration is failing the most. You have to engage. And there is so much death in West Virginia with respect to fentanyl and a lot of these products that get shipped, uh, once again, originating in China. But we actually know some of the pathways. We know the routes. We actually could bring pressure and power to bear against the Mexican drug cartels and the Chinese who we know are doing it, right? So the, the issue is we need to have uh, that engagement at that level. Uh, if I could, I would, but uh, the Constitution doesn't really give the West Virginia Attorney General or the West Virginia Governor the ability to uh, you know, bring troops to bear or to negotiate agreements with foreign nations. That's not the way our constitutional system works. However, we can certainly be a very loud voice. And you are absolutely correct to raise this issue today, because I think it is one of the greatest failings of the Biden administration. And I can tell you this, I, I know when President Trump was in office, I used to talk to him about the opioid epidemic, about uh, fentanyl and what was going on in terms of the poison coming over. And we had a couple of conversations and they were willing to do a heck of a lot more than what we've seen here. And this should not be a partisan issue. I know that in West Virginia, uh, I was fortunate that we were able to put together the West Virginia First Foundation with the support of every single county in the state of West Virginia, virtually every city, every delegate and senator who voted vote in favor of this structure, which is not only going to address the legal pain pill problem, but it addresses the uh, problems floating, flooding from China to Mexico and here into the U.S. and West Virginia. And I, I'm, I'm hopeful you'll talk about this more and more. Patrick, is there a way, if, if we assume a fentanyl death, and we can trace the source of the fentanyl back to through the distribution chain to uh, where, wherever it starts within the laws of West Virginia. Is there a nexus to charge each stop along the distribution route with homicide or supporting so we've homicide? Looked, we've actually looked at this issue and um, I never want to rule anything out, but uh, we looked at it from the perspective of could you go after a lot of people in that channel? And the answer is you have to overcome some of the sovereign immunity uh, obstacles along the way. And when we looked at it a few years ago, uh, and I had our whole team go through this and we examined it, you know, you saw there were some lawsuits years ago, but they never really manifested itself into, into real things because you have to get over that sovereign immunity, the tort immunity that's uh, provided uh, to the Chinese government and to a lot of these Chinese companies. So it's a very, very high bar uh, and you have to have uh, undisputable evidence about that. So How I would say that if we could, there's still going to be opportunities, not only for the feds to do it, but, you know, if the states have enough evidence to go through, I, I think 
this is the duck test. You know it's a duck. It looks like a duck. It quacks like a duck. Um, everything in your senses tells you it's a duck, um, and it's you know coming from China with intent. But you have to actually go through and prove that. I think it's happening. I think that there are going to be opportunities in the upcoming months and years ahead uh, to crack down on this more. And I'll go one step further. I think there's a huge problem with the financial system where there are, there are dollars that are flowing. Uh, because keep in mind, this is a financial crime as well, because monies get deposited into the banks. But a lot of times these guys are trying to avoid the U.S. banks, and they're going to other banks uh, in order to bypass scrutiny uh, here in the U.S. And we need to crack down on that as well, because if you go after the money, that allows you to better go after the underlying problem. You cut the money off, and that's going to that's going to put a lot of these dealers out of out of business. But if 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 we don't bother taking the fight to um, either Mexico or China, wherever over across borders, if the duck is swimming in West Virginia, can we prosecute Charlie, the corner drug dealer, for distributing the fentanyl that killed somebody? Yeah, we, we can. I mean, you can, and we, we should, most certainly. And one of the things, guys, that I've tried to do is, first of all, I do want to dramatically expand this uh, so that we are going after people uh, overseas uh, in China and the Mexican drug cartels. And would I, I've asked this administration to work with me and work with other state attorneys general. Just said they've just turned a deaf ear to that. But here in West Virginia, there are a couple things we've already done. I've actually called on the uh, current attorney general, Merrick Garland, uh, to uh, free up additional resources for fentanyl prosecutions. I think we have uh, generally good U.S. attorneys here in West Virginia, and they want to go after a lot of these crimes. They need more resources to do it, and we should be going after them. Uh, when they violate the law, you do it locally. When we have evidence of wrongdoing on a county prosecutor level, we should be doing it. Guys, as you know, we don't have very much original criminal jurisdiction here in the West Virginia AG's office. But uh, there are people in, in West Virginia who have access uh, to uh, prosecutorial authority. And I think it should be absolutely used for the guy on the, on the corner who's trafficking this because we need to cut off their distribution network and send a message that this is unacceptable. I know people have talked about the death penalty. Um, they talked about expanding the crimes. I think these are all things we need to look at. West Virginia needs to have no tolerance for these people that are not only putting poison into our, uh, our streets, but the nature of the fight is changing. We started this conversation talking about nitazines, that might, products that may be 20 times, 50 times more powerful uh, than what we've been seeing on the streets. Yes, that warrants a much more aggressive, well, it all warrants a very aggressive response. This is the first time I've heard the term, the word, is it nitazine? Yeah, nitazine is one of the deadly drugs. It's It's been not publicized widely, uh, but they, uh, they, they were developed in the 1950s, but law enforcement really started to detect them back in 2019. And so uh, we're seeing, obviously, increases in fentanyl and fentanyl deaths, which is a huge problem. And we're starting to hear a lot more about nitazines. Uh, and I'm hopeful when we get the next statistics, I actually always hope that there are going to be fewer deaths involved. But uh, that through this attention, if you're a mom, if you're a dad, if you're a law enforcement official, we want to make sure everyone knows this is such dangerous stuff that we have to avoid at all costs. Attorney General Patrick Morrissey, our guest uh, here on the program, just a, a couple of minutes left. Patrick, are you doing any opioid awareness uh, high school football games uh, with the Attorney General's office around the state this fall? We, we are. We're actually uh, doing them every week, and uh, I'm excited about that because this is part of the broader education effort. And, guys, when we think about taking on the drug epidemic, uh, I, I will say when I took over the AG's office, there was virtually no structure in place to fight the drug uh, epidemic. Isn't that amazing? Virtually none. Yes, they'd be involved in some litigation, but we really started to build that. And one of the first things we did 
is we wanted to begin better educating uh, people across West Virginia. So we actually worked with a couple members of the legislature on curriculum in the schools. We worked with schools of pharmacy, schools of nursing, on going into the schools and educating them. We uh, started to do the Opioid Awareness Games of the Week. We've done hundreds of those games, so you can actually talk to people in the sports community because we had stats that once people uh, took these opioids as opposed to non-opioid alternatives, they were four times more likely to get addicted. So we've done so much of the education work. And then, of course, we have our Kids Kick Opioid Project, uh, which we've, we actually have at the Capitol right now a lot of the posters that are showing with all the regional and the state-based winners. So this is a huge issue for us. And, and quite frankly, I'm glad uh, that after we started it, a lot of people picked up the banner uh, because you need to have evidence-based education to really go after this. And uh, more state-based entities and the governor's office um, after we had done this, really started to pick it up. And I applaud that, quite frankly, uh, because I remember growing up when we had GARE and we had other educational systems, people took it very seriously. And it seemed like there was a huge gap where there was very little education going on. That education needs to continue. And I think that's going to be part of what the West Virginia First Foundation, the entity that uh, will house the settlement money, that that entity is going to have the ability to help invest in some pretty neat programs to really address kind of the core uh, educational needs that we have here in the state. So you guys are, thank you for talking about this really important issue. As you can tell, I'm pretty passionate about it because we need to save as many lives as we can. Attorney General Patrick Morrissey, final word is yours. Anything else? No, I just want to uh, thank you for having me on today, and I appreciate it. I'm looking forward to getting back to the Panhandle and uh, spending more time. I was fortunate to get up there a lot in August, and I'll be back up again. Uh, so I, I'm looking forward to seeing some folks uh, in the very near future. Very good. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Hey, thanks so much, guys. Appreciate it. Attorney General Patrick Morrissey. And-